Hi guys, how's it going? My name's Helena and I'm a Young People's Programming team member over at the Wigton Festival Company. This event is brought to you by Book Week Scotland, which is kindly supported by the Scottish Book Trust. I'm delighted to be introducing you today to the wonderful Elle McNichol with her new book, A Kind of Spark. A Kind of Spark follows the adventures of 11-year-old Addie, who's campaigning to get a memorial built in her hometown to commemorate the witch trials that have happened in previous years. I really hope you guys enjoyed the book as much as I did, but you're not here to hear me speak, you're here to hear Elle speak. So I'm delighted to pass you over to Elle McNichol. Uh, hi everyone, welcome again to this event with Elle McNichol and this is from Book Week Scotland, supported by Scottish Book Trust and produced by the Wigtown Festival Company. I am Gavin Hetherington and I am so fortunate to be joined with Elle McNichol, the incredible author of Kind of Spark. And we will be talking about publishing and neurodivergent representation and publishing in this segment. So Elle, I believe that you do already have a bit of a history with being in publishing. You kind of seen different sides of it. So can you tell us what you did before you became an author to get you to where you are now? Yeah, so I've always loved books. And um, as soon as I learned that publishing was the industry that that you know made the books you know the people who edit the books the people who design the covers the people who sell the books I thought that's an industry I really want to be involved in how exciting because at the time I didn't think being an author was possible I thought that was too um, impossible I really wanted to be in publishing so I studied publishing at UCL which is a university in London and that was great um, got to meet lots of interesting people um, and that's where I wrote what's called a dissertation which is a very long academic paper and I wrote it on the lack of representation in children's publishing uh, for neurodiversity which sounds quite serious but it's it's not too serious it just means that I was reading lots of kids books which have come out in the last you know few years or so and they were all excellent like they were really good books and I loved reading them and I would get through them quickly and I was saying that's a fabulous book but the more I read the more I realized as brilliant as these books are there aren't any characters in them like me meaning a neurodivergent person somebody who is autistic or dyspraxic or has ADHD or Tourette's or um, you know people with any kind of disabilities really so you know down syndrome or wheelchair users there just didn't seem to be any representation in in the books and I just thought you know as brilliant as these books are as exciting as it is that's really sad because 20 percent of the population so if you're doing maths, that's a fifth. 20% um, of the population is disabled in some way. That's a huge amount of people. That's millions of people. And they're not being represented in books. So if I was to take, you know, five random books um, off the shelf, statistically, if it was matching up to society, at least one of those books should be, you know, have a disabled character. And that wasn't the case. I wasn't finding any. So it wasn't matching up. And I just thought that's really sad because I remember being a kid. I remember being 10, 11, 12, loving reading, just obsessed with reading, burning through books in the library and not reading any characters like me. And I thought that's quite sad. You know, I'm not that old, I'm 28, which is not that old. But, <laughs> but, you know, 20 years, nothing's really changed. And I just thought, that's quite sad. And um, so, yeah, I went into publishing before I was an author um, to do editorial work and a little bit of marketing work. And I would voice a lot of these opinions and say, look, we need to have more, you know, kids books with disabled characters and neurodivergent characters. You know, these kids read and they, they need to be represented. Um, and that was part of a big wide conversation that's happening in, in publishing at the moment about all kinds of, um, you know, inclusive um, problems, you know, lack of inclusivity. Uh, but that was what I was focused on. So, yeah, I do have experience in publishing and I've been, you know, making lots of noise for the last couple of years. Excellent. So I guess not just the fact that there isn't representation for children in books, 
but for neurodivergent people or anybody with a disability to see themselves with jobs in publishing. So there was like a huge gap there as well. So it's a, really about getting um, a lot of disabled, um, to see them, people to see themselves in jobs in publishing. So um, that's, where the, that's where the change will happen. So it needs to be internal. So do, do you think it's hard for people with disabilities to get jobs in publishing and or do you think there's a change there or so if any of you watching are fans of Hamilton there is a song in Hamilton called the room where it happens where a character is singing about he says I have to be in the room where it happens um meaning I have to be in the room where the decisions are getting made and it's it's really important in rooms that are very powerful to look around and go who's in this room do they all look the same do they all think the same? Do they all come from the same place and have the same background? And if the answer is yes, then that might mean that there could be some, some um, issues and maybe certain things are not noticed or picked up on. Um, so it's about getting people inside that room so that they can work hard and have their voice heard. And yeah, I there are of course disabled people in publishing. They work very, very hard, but statistically it's, it's very, very low, very low indeed, um, considering how active disabled people are in the sort of reading community, you know, they love books and are very, very passionate about reading. I just didn't see that um, reflected fairly in, in employment. So yeah, I think it is quite hard. Um, I went on a few um, meetings when I was in editorial work and I would bring up the fact that I'd done all this research about neurodiversity and publishing and that I was uh you know I thought there should be more kids books with disabled protagonists and a few rooms um you know really laughed at that and thought you know what a waste of time and um and some people you know they didn't laugh but they said there's not a market for that um you know we, people don't really want to read about that um you know that's that's kind of a non-starter and that was discouraging and I don't think they were saying it to be mean you know I think they were just like I just said there weren't people in the room to say to them actually you're wrong um and that's what's so great about a kind of spark is that a kind of spark came out and people you know it sold out on its publication day and people have been writing to me every day saying how much it means to them and how, much, how glad they are to finally have a book like this. So that's why we need people in, in all areas of publishing, you know, not just writing the books, um, but also producing them and editing them and selling them because then they can, you know, they can bring their own expertise to it. And they can also put their hand up sometimes and say, oh, I think you might be a bit wrong about that because, you know, in my experience, da da da, um, you know, it's a long time ago, a lot of rooms were just boys um, and, and that's not great. And, you know, publishing used to be just boys, you know, hundreds, hundreds of years ago. Um, it, you know, you if you were a woman, you weren't allowed to work in publishing and you would have to publish books under a boy's name. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit like that in a sense, in that it's not the norm now, but the more we work and the more we have these conversations and the more we show up, and the more we support each other, then that's going to change and the door is going to get wider and wider and more people are going to come and join the table. And, you know, there's a great bookshop in Brixton, uh, which is in London, if any of you ever get to go to it, called Roundtable Books. And they're a bookshop that specialise in kids books that are inclusive. So books about black kids and by black authors, books about LGBTQ people by authors and disabled kids by a disabled author you know it's all different kinds of people and the reason it's called the round table bookshop is because it's exactly that everyone's at a table that's round just like king arthur there's no head of the table there's no hierarchy there's no one person that's more important than anyone else we're all just sitting around a table and all we need to do now is make sure that we're listening to everybody to make that table bigger so that there's more room for people to sit at it um, we don't need to be telling people, you know, there's no room for you at this table. We need to be making that table as big as possible. Yeah. And with you saying as well about how publishers are saying, oh, this won't sell or anything like that. I mean, now we have a case in point of with like a kind of spark in all of the awards it's been up for. 
And I love that you mentioned that this was an all uh, like neurodivergent team who worked on this. You know, we had the cover creator who, as you mentioned, has ADHD, the editor, the editorial team. This was all really um, curated by neurodivergent people. So mm -hmm. it, this is like a demonstration now of, I guess, for publishers to say, if you just give it a chance, this is what will happen because they're looking at numbers that, you know, are outdated because they, of course, it's going to look like books by disabled authors aren't going to sell because they haven't published them. That yeah. is why. So, yeah, it's just about giving it a chance. So I guess um, yeah. my question, yeah. Publishing is a business um, and sometimes people in business are a little bit scared to take risks. But I think, you know, some risks are really worth taking and um, diversity, which is a word that we hear a lot um, in a lot of industries, but diversity isn't a trend. It's really here to stay because it's the world we live in. Um, if you look around it, you know, maybe some of you are in classrooms or maybe some of you um, are at school. If you look around at your school friends, you will all be very different. You know, not everybody will have the same skin color. Not everybody will have the same kind of brain. Not everybody will be the same gender. And, and that's great. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it exciting. Um, so that's why books should be the same way. You know, film and television should be the same way. Politics should be the same way. It's, you know, we should have systems that reflect the world that we all live in. Because if you really, you know, if you really look closely at the everyone around you, we are all very very different and it's important to reflect those differences and celebrate them. Um, but yeah, I think you're exactly right. There were no disabled books to speak of. So it, it was very much a lot of people saying, uh, well, this is the way we've always done it. We're a little bit too scared to change that. And um, I was really lucky to find publishers that weren't scared to change that. And, and they've reaped, you know, they've reaped the rewards because, you know, I, I, I hope the risk has paid off. <laughs> um, but, but now that, you know, I get messages from young ND authors going, I'm going to write a book, you know, why shouldn't I now? And I think, of course, of course, of course you should. You know, and that's, that's exciting and, and thrilling. Um, so absolutely, yes, I think they were afraid of the risk, but you know, if in business, you've got to take a risk. 100%, 100%, otherwise they'll remain stagnant. People will probably get, you know, really tired of the same formulaic. They'll yeah. not see any, anything diverse in, in, their, in their books, which is a shame. But do you now see a positive change in publishing? Do you think this, like after 2020, there might be some more publishers that might give it like take a chance on on neurodivergent authors or neurodivergent teams of people like editors and cover designers and all of that I hope so because I think we've had a crazy year we've had a very difficult year and I think one good thing that's come out of this is because we a lot of us have been at home a lot more we've had we're doing you know and if it weren't for COVID Gab and I might be in the same room right now talking but instead we're talking over I know but it's great that we can do this but for a lot of disabled people this kind of uh, p platform is is easier and this is you know better for them you know working from home is is better for them so what I would say to the publishing industry is like okay we know we can do it we know we can work from home now you know that you can include everybody virtually or on zoom or you know through social media so let's do that let's stop you know creating these narrow little barriers and saying well you know if you can't if you can't come to the office every single day you can't do this job that's that's silly if you can do the job at home you can do the job at home um you know the unfortunate thing before covid is i would go to diversity and inclusivity events which are events this is a big boring grown-up words but it's their events to um talk about these kind of things in publishing and I would go to these events and they would be held in you know on the third floor of a building that didn't have a lift and I would say you know if you're a wheelchair user or you you know you have chronic pain or you don't walk very well you can't get to that room like you've you've put your your uh, your conference in a, in a place that's not accessible to a lot of disabled people what kind of message does that send what does that say to them it says you know even when we're talking about diversity you are not included and that's that's really heartbreaking so i'm really hoping going forward now you know we're all you know pulling together to get through this this um 
this pandemic. And I'll say, let's look, let's take what we've learned and let's make sure everyone's included going forward. You know, if someone in the meeting needs to be on Zoom instead of in person, great, let's do it, let's make it work. Um, if somebody can't do in-person events, let's make it work. Um, if someone needs, you know, a, 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 a sign language interpreter, let's make it work. It's that's just how it needs to be going forward. Um, and and of course, yeah, getting more authors and, and publishing employees who also not only are disabled, but are proud and, and comfortable and supported in being openly disabled. Because, you know, I've been neurodivergent my whole life. I have not felt comfortable talking about it professionally until the last year. You know, when I was working in an office, it was not okay really for me to talk about it. It was very difficult. Um, so it's important that we also make sure people feel safe and comfortable and supported in talking about being disabled at work or at school. You know, if you're at school right now, it's important that you know that you deserve accommodation and you deserve accessibility. That's your right. So it, that's what we need to remember going forward is this is people's rights. Um, people have the right to work. They have the right to accommodations and accessibility. We have to include everyone by law. That is, that's what I'd like to see going forward. And some great new stories as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you say to the people, like anybody who is neurodivergent or has a disability, what would you say to them to kind of encourage them to pursue, like if publishing or writing or any kind of job where it seems like they're being excluded, yeah. um, what would you say, to, like, what is like the encouragement for them if they're watching this and they're a bit scared to, to pursue that? What is it that you would say to them to, to inspire them to do that? First of all, I'd say I totally understand. I totally understand how scary it can be. Second of all, like I just said, it's your right. You are 100% within your rights to be fully who you are. It's nobody else's business um, except yours. And thirdly, I would say these rooms need you. These, these rooms really need you to be in them. So don't wait for people to give you permission. Don't wait for somebody to you know, put their hand out and say, you are now allowed to do this don't wait, just go. You are allowed to be in any room. You belong in that room. You are needed in that room. I need to see you in that room. I am holding the door open and saying, come through this door, as many of you as possible. So do it. Don't even think, well, maybe I shouldn't, maybe they don't, don't listen, go forward. It's like running a race. If you're running a race, you can't be looking at who's next to you. Also running, you have to just look at that finish line. And if that finish line is your dream, your ambition, whatever it is, don't let anybody, least of all yourself, tell you for a minute that you do not deserve to be there and that you do not deserve to go for it. So don't wait for permission is what I would say. Do it. Just do it. Yeah, I think as soon as other people realise that people with disabilities aren't a hindrance to anybody else, they deserve to be in that room. They deserve to be helping with those decisions and um, speaking not just for themselves, but people who are like them as well, um, which is a really tough job um, for people who feel marginalized to do so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely going to be some kind of at least conversation with that in the future, I think. Oh, as um, long so, as I'm around, there's going to be. Yeah, I was, I was just about to ask, like, um, now you've had this experience this year, which has been a bit of a crazy year, it's been a different year. Um, even though you've had the experience that you've had this year, it's been mostly positive for you. So in the future, you're still going to be writing. You're still going to be in the publishing industry. I hope. I want to write as <laughs> I hope. I want to write books for as long as I can. And my next book is not to do with a kind of spark, but it's got a neurodivergent main character. It's got two, actually. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to keep doing that. Um, and I hope, I hope that in a few years it won't be strange. That people won't call me the neurodivergent author they'll just call me an author and it won't be unusual what I'm doing um yeah and I will say for anyone you know listening it's not perfect sailing there are still people who don't think I should be in this industry and that's okay because I don't need to worry about them what other people think of me is none of my business I am here for my work and what I needed when I was a kid and for all the incredible people that write to me who say keep going keep doing it um because books are the most incredible things in the world and they are for everybody 
they should not just be for one little portion of people they should be for all of us and so you know there's work to do but as long as you know as long as I'm around I'll be doing the work yeah books really do help shape everyone not just children but even teenagers and adults who well, might be learning. reading every book yeah. I pick up I learn I'm still learning I'm still growing yeah Thank you again, everybody, for joining the Book Week Scotland event, uh, supported by Scottish Book Trust, produced by Wigtown Festival Company. Thank you so much again to the incredible Al McNichol for joining me for this event. And hopefully we will see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.